on the first page, on the first page uh, of the actual text, um, the preface, which is on page 22. And, uh, and it says this, I'll just read it. Blessed Charchen went into the presence of Padampa Sangya. By the way, you know, Padampa Sangya means Holy Father Buddha. And I'll tell you a little bit about Padampa Sangya in a minute. So Blessed Charchen, who was a student of Padampa's, went into his presence, and this is what happened. Your holiness, said Charchen, you have become old. Your holiness, it is easy to see you now, but you will be gone from this place. To whom will the Dingri people entrust their minds? What shall we do? Charchen wept. This is uh, so apt for us now because this wonderful generation of teachers uh, is going, are going to their next lives. Um, and already many of those teachers have gone. And I know that, uh, you know, our beloved Jamspal, Lozang Jamspal, who, who actually was my primary teacher, and I know very beloved to many of you, I'm looking at Susan, um, you know, Jamspal is now aging, finding it hard to talk, and this is, and this is what this is what happens, and this is a a big subject of, of the aphorisms that Padampa Sangya then gives to Charchen. It's so moving and so emotional, right? We are just like Charchen, and you know, people often say Buddhists are, oh, Buddha was not emotional. Um, that in order to approach the Buddhist way of things, you have to hide your emotions, control your emotions. Um, I don't think so. You know, I think that that any teaching that deals with emotion and emotion is so central to Buddhist teaching, desire, the emotion of hatred, aversion, insecurity, anxiety. It's so central to Buddha's teaching that of course, Buddha and anyone who's interested in this teaching will be deeply emotional. That's because we all are deeply emotional and that's okay. And that's part of our human condition. And that's just what Padampa Sangya is focusing on. And so, so I would dedicate, you know, anything that we do here to, uh, you know, to Rinpoche and DNKL, of course, and and uh, all of all of you who maintain this wonderful presence. You know, also these teachers like Gelek Rinpoche, Locho Rinpoche, Rizong Rinpoche, who have departed over the past few years, and many other beloved lamas. You know, may they appear again soon. So. Um, I have to. I have to say, um, you know, I don't. I don't have any pretensions of being able to teach this text, um, but in this time of degeneration, what else can we do other than be a sangha and approach these things together? So, if anyone has at any point any uh, questions or wants to make a point, please let's do it, Susan. Well, one thing I do know is that these practitioners are always weeping when they see their teachers. So if they're not showing it to the public, they're showing it among their own, you know, devotees and people they are devoted to. Yeah. And all yeah. these uh, hagiographies. Ain't, ain't, ain't it the truth? Right. Ain't it the truth? Okay. And, 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 you know, so, uh, this, this, by the way, I'll tell you a little thing. I maybe 30, 35 years ago, um, uh, Jamspal uh, uh, was teaching me the alphabet. And after he taught me the Tibetan alphabet, we started, we quote unquote, started translating this text. So anything good in here, of course, is the, <laughs> is from Genla. Isn't that something? Yeah. You did this 35 years ago? I yeah, realize. something like that. Yeah, wow. long time, long time. 
So, you know, and then as I, there's also, you know, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, who is, was head of the Nima order, um, and and was a a reincarnation of Padampa Sangya. Um, he he translated something that wasn't in our text, but it's great. It, it's the verses you say such clever things to people, but you don't apply them to yourself. People of Tengri, the faults within you are the ones to be exposed. So, so I uh, you know so that's you know that's I think a description of me anyway. You know I. You know, I'm very interested in this, like many, many of us, many Buddhists. And Buddhists, in my experience, they're not really better than anyone else. They just need the teachings more. So here, so here we are. So uh, I'll say a little bit about uh, Padapa Sangya. Did you go into this some, his biography? We didn't go uh, too much into his biography. I, I, I didn't want to get into that because it's like, it's like long and it takes a lot to to get into and like all of his like amazing acts and all of this. So we just went straight to the, the discussion. Okay. Well, that's good. I'll tell you a little bit, you know, he, uh, there's, a, there's an amazing oral tradition about his biography, um, many, many incarnations. And, and according to the, uh, according to the Tibetan tradition, he was born around 545 of the common era and lived to 1117. It's a long time, you know, like those, like all those, all those guys in the Bible, you know, living six, eight, a hundred, a thousand years. Um, and, and it said also that he was uh, a reincarnation of Kamala Shila, a very great uh, uh, teacher who had that great debate with uh, Ashang Mahayana about whether the path should be gradual or immediate. And, uh, and he won that one. There's also, now the thing about Padampa was he had dark skin. He came from South India and, uh, and he was very widely traveled and he spoke a lot of languages. Probably his native language was Telugu, but he learned Tibetan and he could relate to the Tibetans very much like, like Rinpoche or Gaelic Rinpoche could relate to Americans. He He really got into it so he so his sayings are very gated toward the uh the scene where he was which is uh of course upaya skillful means teaching what is helpful to whoever is being taught or helped and so when we look at when we look at the overall hundred sayings of padampa sangya if you look at about the first 40 of them, and so they're up to 100, the first 40 have to do with renunciation and bodhicitta, the spirit of enlightenment, um, which, of course, is very good for us um, who need a whack in the head as far as all these things go. Then we go in the middle part of this to uh, what he says about natural mind and emptiness. And then, uh, and then in the last part, he goes back to basics. And uh, so, so let's take a look at at what he's saying. And you know, they they but let me the, his uh, the fact that he had dark skin was no big deal in India, but it might have been a big deal in Tibet. How do you like that? Uh, and the story about him is that he was conceived when his father was away. And, and his mother really tried to abort him. And, uh, and actually even tried to, to kill herself by drinking poison. And therefore, he was born with dark skin. Um, yeah. And, uh, and there's, there's, another, there's another great story um, Padampa and another yogi were walking around and they found that an elephant had uh, died and had fallen so that the, the corpse of the elephant was uh, right next to a water source for a village. 
and it was polluting the water source and a lot of people could get hurt. And so, and, and so Padapa and the yogi, both of whom had mastered not only what we call the transmundane siddhi or accomplishment of enlightenment, but also the mundane cities, all the magic powers which go along with, uh, with being an expert yogi, like being able to transfer your consciousness, like speed walking, walking through walls, all of that. And so there they were, and, and they said, well, okay, let's, let's one of us uh, transfer our consciousness into the elephant so the elephant can walk away and not pollute this water source. And they went, and they went back and forth and forth and back. And, uh, and eventually Padampa said, okay, I'll do it. And so he went, he, he transferred his consciousness into the, uh, into the elephant. And uh, the elephant got up and walked away. And then it was time for Padampa to come back into his body. But meanwhile, the other guy, who's, who had dark skin, um, saw Padampa's body and thought, wow, he's got a much better body than me. And so he went into Padampa's body. And so Padampa had to go into his body. So these are some of the uh, tales that surround Padampa Sangya, and uh, but he was well known as a a a wandering, well traveled yogi with all kinds of powers, having reached full enlightenment. And uh, he taught his most famous student was Machig Ladron, a woman uh, who founded the practice of of chod, of cutting off of. Uh, which is a whole practice that is very important in many traditions. And Padampa Sangya's main practice was he called the Jiched, which is uh, which is pacification, uh, which is also accepted by all of the orders of uh, of 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 Tibetan Buddhism, the four orders. So anyway, so let's look at uh, any any questions about Padampa? Yes, hey, Susan. I just wanted to say that if you read the biography of Machik Labdron, he appears, you know, he's in there and he yeah. has a relationship with her. Yeah, it's unclear how close it was. Yeah, right. But we we don't know. You know, these yeah. are, you know, it's so interesting. Of course, we, we... Oh, wait, she's a reincarnation of him or something. Well, they... Her, uh... he, is, she he dies in a cave and then... Wait. Well, the question we we really don't know, and there are oh. so many stories. Okay, you know, and it it is said that uh, uh, that he also was an incarnation of one of Buddha's disciples, close disciples. So, so okay. he's, but anyway, he's really amazing. So let's okay. look at let's look at since some of you haven't gone uh, from the beginning. Let's see if we can rock it through this. Because otherwise, we'll just get up instead of to seven, we'll get up to 10. Okay, so let's look, let's start with, uh, let's start with uh, numero uno, which I love, which is strive to push your body, speech and mind into the Holy Dharma, it will become the best of your, of your karma. Um, I think that's pretty clear. Um, but isn't it interesting? Um, that uh, that we go right in it and and this you know it it you could translate the the word which we've translated as push your body into it as practice hard but but that's okay uh, and and you know what this says is it's not always on our timetable and now is the time not later but right now. So as we read this, let's think about how would we strive to push our body, speech, and mind into the dharma? How would we do that? Now, when I first went to John's Paul, I think it was in that first session when he started to teach me the, alph the alphabet, Tibetan alphabet, I figured I'd ask him the hard question. So I said, Genla, what is dharma? He thought about it, and then he answered, he said, benefit others. 
I've never heard better definition of Dharma. Benefit others. So let's uh, let's go on. And, and uh, the next one is beautiful too. Hand your mind, heart, and breast to the three jewels. A blessing will forcefully occur. Right? Not only your your mind and your heart, but your breast, your body, your whole self. Uh, so often these days, especially in the world of of technology uh, and and artificial intelligence, we kind of forget about the body. And yet, in these teachings and Buddhist teachings generally, it's so. Our body is so precious, and it it certainly is. So uh, so let's keep let's let's keep going so we can get through these. A bless. Any questions or comments on that one? A blessing will forcefully occur. That's a good prognostication. And by the way, blessing. The word for blessing. In Tibetan is uh, chinlap, and and chin means either give or it can mean splendor or resplendence, beauty. And lap is a wave. So it could say you could translate this as you know a blessing as waves of radiance. And I think Genla told me that in our first meeting. Could be way and and another thing that that Genla was always very big on is pronouncing Tibetan in the ancient way. So, so those of you who are studying Tibetan or know Tibetan, if you look at Chinlaps, if you pronounced it the way it's written, you would say Bin Rulaps, and Jamsbal's big thing. Is that we should we should pronounce this in the ancient way so it's preserved? Yes, yeah, Susan. It was one of my favorite words from the beginning, <laughs> but I remember this and I couldn't get it out of my head. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, totally. Yeah, it's so cool. I know waves of radiance. Yeah, it's much better than blessing, isn't it? Isn't it? Waves of radiance. Imagine that there you are. There you are, and you've handed your mind, your heart, and your breast to the three jewels, and a wave of radiance hits you. Just imagine, right now, a wave of radiance. And it's one thing so wonderful, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about, if you just, um, have a solid body and perceive yourself as the water as well as the wave, just you'll be in a state of, of wonder. This is what Padampa is saying. Waves of radiance. So, and we'll get into this when we get to the section on mind, but we all have access to this fantastic ecstasy, which is everything around us. Um, so let's uh, let's keep going, otherwise we'll, we'll get to seven even. Okay, so what he says in number three is give up this life and concentrate on the goal of your next life. This will become the top of your plan. Dingri people, by the way, Dingri, is the place where he spent the last uh, 20 years um, up north in the mountains. And this is all to the Tingri people. And so this is, uh, um, give up this light and concentrate, and concentrate on the goal of your next life. Now, now of course, we all know that, that uh, there are many different kinds of people, right? And practitioners. Uh, some uh, think that uh, studying the Dharma will help them in this life. Amen. 
will. It will, if nothing else. Some who are more serious, they think, you know, if I really study the Dharma, maybe I won't have to come back again. Right? Or if I do come back, I'll have a better life. Maybe I'll be in a God realm. Maybe I'll, you know, be in a good family and all that. But then, then, then Tsongkhapa talks about this. They all talk about this. The, the person of highest capacity, and it's kind of dangling that out to us because, of course, we want to think that we're in the highest capacity. It's such a shrewd teaching method. Um, we say we just want to become Buddhists so we can benefit others. Just what Jamsbal said about the Dharma. That's what it is, benefit others. And Shanti Deva, of course, pointed out that if you think about yourself, you're just going to be miserable. And amazingly, you think about others, you'll be happy. Such a shrewd teaching mechanism. And no wonder, because Buddha had his enlightenment experience when he was about 35, um, you know, left, left the palace, wandered, starved, drank some milk, sat under the Bodhi tree, and then he started to teach, and he taught for 40 years. And he taught every kind of person, very different than, uh, than some other religious figures. I mean, take Jesus, right? Uh, only around for 33 years. Buddha taught for 40, 45 years. So he became an expert pedagogue. So, so anyway, so this is one of those things where he's saying, okay, give up this life and concentrate on the goal of your next life. But think about that. We're so involved in this life. What do you think the goal of your next life will be? I mean, me, being the kind of person I am, all right, I want to be a great pianist or violinist in my next life. So at the age of 60, I started studying piano so I could just have a little bit and come back in my next life. That's not exactly benefit others, although if I played well enough, maybe I could benefit others. Anyway, so so then we got, now here we come up with something. Now we're going to talk about family life. Does, do all of you have families? How could you not? Right? Why do they call it the nuclear family? <laughs> Or as Bush would have said, the nuclear family. Well, Padampa says family life is impermanent, like visitors to the marketplace. Don't argue and fight, Dingri people. Impermanent visitors to the marketplace. And he goes on uh, um, a little bit later when we get to, uh, uh, what is it? Basically, when they're done with you, they're gone. And that's how it is. You know, we, as, especially as we get older, we see that our most beloveds will go. It's the truth of impermanence. And here, very, you know, very to the point in this series of aphorisms. Don't argue and fight. You know, does, does this mean you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't love your family? I don't think so. It just says don't argue and fight. Okay, and then he goes on to to capitalism, and he says in five, wealth and substance are like borrowed illusion. Don't tie yourself up in a knot of stinginess with them, Dingri people. Now, now very uh, key here uh, that he says in the Tibetan tabu, which means like, you know, because here's where Buddhism differs from, say, Hinduism. Whereas you could say that everything is Maya illusion. Buddhists don't, they don't say that. They say it's like illusion like the reflection of the moon and water, like a magician's trick. So it's there, but you can't take it so seriously. You can't give it a 
a capital T there. It's just a small T there. And uh, wealth and substance are like that. Does it mean you should never have wealth? Well, I don't think so. But it means don't get tied up in it because you're going to have to, you can't take it with you as the saying goes. Right? So then, now we get to the body. We're almost to where you all left off last time. Wouldn't it be cool if we got the whole thing? Should we try to do that? Let's go for it. Come sure. on. Okay. Let's go for it. Come on, Dave. Okay, let's go for it. So the body of aggregates is a leather bag for impure substances. Don't cleanse this while wishing for superiority. You know, this is, uh, you know, Padampa, you know, had lived for a good part as a naked yogi. You know, very much like uh, Diogenes, the cynic. Um, uh, by the way, cynic, you know, the cynic philosophy that comes from uh, the Greek word uh, kinikos, which means dog, because... Diogenes went around like a dog, right? And I don't think his master followed him around with a plastic bag. Okay, but so so Padapa for a part of his time was like that. Now this this business about the leather, your body being a leather bag, of course, this is this is um, very much like Shanti Deva in his chapter eight of the Bodhicharya Avatara, when he talks about, uh, oh, that, you know, that that woman you love, that you lust after, just think about what's inside her body, just think about when she goes to the bathroom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is, of course, a uh, very basic training. You might call this part basic training in the first part for all of us. Um, so don't, you know, it, it's the opposite of my body is a temple. <laughs> Not really. Right. So, so so he's saying, don't don't get into this wealth, money. Don't think it's all about your family forever. And then, oh, yeah. And then he says in in number seven, your kinfolk are like illusion. Again, like illusion. Right. You could also say they're like real. And this, of course, is where emptiness and dependent arising uh, come together because we have the truth of your kinfolk. They're there. You love them. You play with them. You rely upon them. You take care of them. But uh, that's just the conventional truth. Ultimately, they're not permanent. They're not your capital K kinfolk, right? They're your small K kinfolk, just like I'm not capital D David, I'm small D David, because I don't, I'm not isolated. I'm not an isolated, intrinsic, inherent self. And because I'm not isolated like that, I can relate. I do relate. So I'm not separated, I'm small D David, right? And if I was just talking to nowhere, uh, people would just think I was crazy, but I'm talking to you, so people might think I'm teaching something, right? Only because of you do I do what I'm doing right now, right? So, uh, okay, now we go into new territory. I love it. Your homeland is like the nomad's halting place. Don't be attached to yearning for it. I remember when um, I asked John's Paul, uh, this is so much fun, Susan. I asked Jamspal, Genla, what will you do when you become old? And he said, I shall have no fixed abode. Doesn't that sound just like him? And in fact, now he's got no fixed abode. His relatives are taking care of him. Uh, like the best sons, he doesn't have any sons. They're nephews and, 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 and kinfolk. They're taking care of him like the best sons or daughters. Um, and he has no fixed abode. He's he's moving all around. He was right. And then, um, you know, there's so, I mean, look at this, your homeland. Don't be attached to yearning for your homeland. Well, what about make America great again? 
kind of yearning for your homeland. I don't think Padampa would favor that. And then he goes on as we burst through where we were before. And to nine, your native valley is held in common by all six as ascension beings, right? Don't grasp at I and, and mine, which of course, um, uh, many different kinds of ascension beings. And now, you know, with uh, artificial intelligence and, and the so-called singularity where as intelligence starts to be designed by artificial intelligence and uh, and we could perhaps, if we live a little bit longer, uh, upload our consciousnesses into computers, um, perhaps live forever, be infinitely intelligent. This is the this is the vision of Ray Kurzweil, who's the who's the chief engineer at Google and many others. And you think, well, what could that possibly have to do with Buddhism? But that that's just like a God realm. It's just like a God realm, you know, one of the six realms where, where if you have some pretty good karma, you could do some great meditation and end up getting born into a, a God realm or a formless realm where you could hang around for a few trillion, zillion years, know everything. But then, according to the Buddhist way of looking at things, your karma would be up and bam, you're back. Where, of course, not you back. And this gets into the question of, if we talk about what in, uh, reincarnation, what is being reincarnated? Is there a self that goes on? Right, uh, and you get many different views of like of this, even within Buddhism, because there are many different people who need to hear many different things in order to alleviate their suffering, in order to help others get out of their suffering, and that's why you have different philosophies within Buddhism. So, uh, so we go there, and of course, then. Now, we're all, let's finish 10, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. The omen of death comes the morning after birth. Realize there is no time. Um, now, of course, you could think of that as being there's no time to waste. But you could think of it in another sense, uh, that there is no time. How do you like that? What if there was no time? And Nagarjuna and his... Introduction of the Middle Way makes it says just that there's no intrinsic time. How do you like that? Um, in any event, even if we don't go cosmic like that, um, it goes very quickly, doesn't it? Damn, and here we are. Okay, so we've now done 10, and it's Oh, we've been going for 40 minutes. You know, we might have to leap. Any questions or comments on this first 10? Pretty basic stuff. It's basic training for us. Okay. Now we're going to move, all right? Okay. 11. Strive for the Holy Dharma. Yes. Having died, you're drawn to the first step of the path. Yes. You are, because... Uh, you know, many different views of death. You know, a lot of Buddhist practitioners have uh, have the view that the mind somehow continues, even if the body does not. But in any event, we can look at it as you don't have something that goes into nothing. And when we die, some there's some cause and effect. So what we are and what we've been creates something else in a very scientific way we're the cause and there's an effect and and it may not be that the baby who's born remembers what it was like to be laura or steve right or louise or or wes or gloria they may not remember that although some do but still we have this this cause and effect and here we go he says in basic training in 12 
right? Be careful about evil and non-virtuous actions, traditional view of karma, right? Um, of course, when you get a little, when you go a little further with Buddhist view of things, karma doesn't exist. Buddha doesn't exist. Doesn't exist in the sense of capital B Buddha or capital K karma, that those things are empty and just conventional reality too. But therefore, if they're empty, then they relate to other things. We can play with them and we can enter the dance and we can help others. Okay, and then we get to the movie theme in 13 where we talk about the field of dreams. Anybody remember that movie? Kevin Costner, baseball, no? Okay, all the things you've done a lot are like, again, we have like, like field of dreams right? Doesn't mean it's illusion. Um, doesn't mean it is a dream, but it's like a dream. Doesn't it feel that way sometimes? Sometimes not. And to what, whatever there is attachment, give it up with your mind. You don't need it anyway. How do you like that? Okay, let's leap. Okay, we're going to leave this world, he says so in 15, right? And now let's go. Is this okay that we jump? We can jump. Whatever, I, I enjoy hearing your commentary, so you should do what you feel comfortable. Okay. I, feel comfortable. I, love, the, I love the whole thing. Yeah, it's beautiful. Maybe you should have like, like four series and just do a little bit each time, you know, so you can yeah, comment. Yeah, I agree. Because I'm getting a lot really out of your enjoy. commentary. Yeah. All right. Well, I haven't, yeah, I haven't really been commenting at all. I wanted to cover some territory. <laughs> hey, I wonder what Padampa would say about that. We can win. So look, maybe we'll do some more of this another time. But let's, but let's now, because we should do this. Let's go up to um, 40, 41, because if we look at 40, everybody with me? We look at 40, you know, 39 and 40, of course it is uh, 39, by belief, devotion and love, evil thoughts are purified, carry your llama on your crown. Okay, your llama is your special gift. We all we all know this. And, uh, you know, I always had such a hard time with guru yoga. You know, all this about the llama, it's probably, it's my own egotism. You know, I don't like anybody ever telling me what to do. And, uh, and, and I really didn't get it. And, uh, and so, but, but, but I had, you know, years ago, I had an MRI. And, uh, you know, you go in there and they, they wheel you into this little hole. And they're going to scan your brain and your body. And they wheeled me in and I totally freaked out. You know, that was years ago. And then, and then years after that, maybe, I don't know, five years ago, well, I had to have another one. And uh, and I figured now, nah, you know, they must have changed the technology. They can't they can't do that to anyone. They can't do that. It's probably just some big thing. You go lie on a table and it's fine. Okay, so I went in there, and uh, and it was again. It was like a coffin, right? Which gives you some insight into my own mind. And, and uh, so I'm in there, and I say the tech. Um, I got to get out of here. And the tech, of course, tried to sweet talk me. He says like, well, um, just take some deep breaths. And, uh, and I said, no, you got to take me out. So he wheeled me out. He took me out of there. And then I thought to myself, what would Jomspal's mind be like? And because I had had, you know, like 30 years with, with Genla, I really knew what his mind was like. And this is, 
you know, the wonderful thing about, you know, long-term and deep relationships with a teacher, right? Like it is with anyone. Um, and I said, uh, put me back in and I was fine because I was able to, for the first time, I think, appreciate guru yoga. Um, so, um, uh, in what way did you because, visualize him while you were in there or something? No, well, I, I, I said to myself, what would Genla's mind be like? And it was like, oh, and it was okay. Oh, so he wouldn't be attached. He wouldn't be afraid. Yeah. You know, you know, when you do a, you do your sadhana and your, you know, the Lama comes down into the top of your head right, and dissolves right. until you both are one. That's what it was like. Oh, cool. Okay. That's that. That's it. But but it was only because I had seen him okay. for years deal yeah. with different things. Okay. You know, I remember at one point, um, I was with him. You know, when he lived on Riverside, and uh, and there was some picture, and it was of a naked woman walking down the stairs. I, I <laughs> don't remember exactly why I decided to show it to him. But I did, and then as I'm handing it to him, I realized, what are you doing? And I'll never forget the way he looked at it. He he had it here, and he just looked. I learned so much from him. Non-judgmental, just looking. Um, all right, so that's... So that's, I lost my place. That was right. Carry your llama on the crown of your head. Always a good thing to do. Now, now these days, you know, we're so divided by technology. Then we were divided by COVID. And these days you can, you know, you can listen to any teacher online, but and the teachings are fantastic. We have amazing access, but it's more difficult to have access to the mind of your teacher, which is so which is so important. Um, and then he says, and the last part of the basic training part of this, flesh and bone together at work will be separate at birth will be separated. Don't hold on to life as permanent dingry people. And uh, and now we go into the solution. In 41, he says, as your esteemed goal, hold on to your natural homeland. Your mind is what he's talking about. It doesn't wander dingry people. Your mind, your natural mind. And this is, of course, uh, you know, very Mahamudra, Zogchen, looking at right now our mind, which is mere clarity and awareness that is clear, it's like sky our mind and all kinds of things come before it. And we'll soon get to my favorite of all of these, but we're not there yet. We're starting with looking at your mind. And then he says, as your esteemed wealth, I, I just love this so much. I can't stop and go slowly. I'm sorry. I can't. Um, as your esteemed wealth, hold on to the treasure of your natural mind, it's inexhaustible. Um, dingry people. And and there, there are so many wonderful stories about all of this. One of the things in, in his commentary on Padampa that Dilgo Kense Rinpoche um, recounted uh, was this. Someone asked, Dampa, what is awareness um, 
at the time of Buddhahood. And Padapa said, it is transcendent wisdom, cleared of, con of, of conceptual thought. Um, and he was asked, does that transcendent wisdom have mindfulness or not? Um, and Padapa said, mindfulness is an ordinary sentient being's intellect. Transcendent wisdom is intellect free. Asked, will the present awareness be gone? Padapa replied, an old man is not separate from the mind and body of his childhood, but the old man does not have the mind and body of his childhood. I remember one time, um, one of Genla's students, uh, this was Nancy. Remember Nancy? Moved out to Colorado, Susan. Anyway, um, Nancy, Genla told me this, and he, he was very proud of himself uh, with this. Um, Nancy said, Genla, do you meditate? And uh, and Jospal said, no. And you, you remember this? And, and Nancy said, why not? And Jospal said, because it would disturb my mind. <laughs> That's so funny. You know, um, which is, you know, which is the essence of this natural mind that Padampa Sankhya is talking about. So we've gone through all of the be aware. It's not going on forever. Carry your llama on your head. And now we get to the, now we get to the guts of it. And then he goes on to 43. He says, as your sublime food, use the excellent flavor of meditation. You will not have any pangs of hunger. It's angry people. As your sublime beverage, drink the ambrosia of mindfulness. It has no discontinuity angry people drink the ambrosia of mindfulness just imagine at any time with your mind your natural mind always there you can drink the ambrosia of mindfulness and then for your best friend Search for self-arising wisdom. It has neither birth nor death, angry people. We're there. You don't have to go any further. That's it. You don't have to study. You don't have to learn everything. You just find your self-arising wisdom, you know, which is so interesting because when we remember uh, the Lama is so important in terms of teaching but buddha said rely on your own on your own mind rely on the teachings not the teacher which is a another lesson for us and then in 46 for your most beloved child search for the infant of awareness it has neither birth nor death the infant of awareness you know how how little kids are full of energy right see things just as they are and then as we as we go further and further in this life we become encrusted with all the pathways of how we always think about things but this self-arising wisdom we have it it's there and it's delightful and then on 47 i love going fast it's great um brandish the sphere of David, i could listen to you all night well well let's let's well okay so let's go brandish the spear of understanding in a state of emptiness, there is no impediment of view. Wow. Um, uh, now, understanding here is Rigpa. 
rigpa as is really the understanding that we have, but brandish it in a state of emptiness. Um, that is, it's not understanding with a capital U. Mm -mm. Buddhism, small b. Philosophy, small p. We need these to get along in the world. That's fine. And then he goes on, he talks about, uh, yeah, I remember, you know, Milarepa. <laughs> you know, I've got all these notes on uh, on these things, like just goes on and on and on that I've written down over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, Milarepa's <laughs> instructions to a woman practitioner, um, if you are happy practicing with the ocean, Waves are the ocean, right? Um, magical waves are the ocean's magical creations. That's us. A wave, Gloria, wave, West, wave, Susan, a wave, and uh, Miller Epa said, "Be the ocean itself." We are the ocean itself. We are, which is momentary comings together in those momentary comings together we can help others we can love and we can use all of everything we encounter with our natural mind to have a sense of energy delight and then he goes on in this way um, teaching us, saying saying the same thing in different ways, because you can never tell what will reach someone. And these verses are so short, these aphorisms. They're really fantastic. Um, yeah, in your ordinary awareness, pay attention without distraction. Okay. In meditation, there is near, neither dullness nor agitation. And now, now we go to something even deeper. In a state of spontaneous arising, you practice unimpeded skill. Spontaneous. You go for it. You communicate. You, you act. In your actions, there is neither acceptance nor rejection. We're so much about accepting and rejection. If we just act, it's a whole different thing. And then in your self-awareing mind, you search for the four undifferentiated bodies. All right? This would be the, you know, Sambhogakaya, the Dharmakaya, the Nirmanakaya. Um, then the Svabhavakaya. Um, you have neither hope nor anxiety for the result. You know, I once, uh, I keep coming back to Genla, you know. Um, and I, I, we were talking about practice. And I said to him, you know, Genla, I've been doing this, but I don't really expect anything from it. And he said, that's right. That's right. Nez, uh, you have neither hope nor anxiety for the result. Right? So, so you practice and you don't expect anything. How great is that? Everything else we do, we expect a result. Oh, I did this for you. Shouldn't you do that for me? You know, no matter what it is. Um... Ah, my favorite of all, 51. The root of samsara and nirvana is just in the mind. Right? Of course, just in the mind. We can be terrified of samsara. We can hope for nirvana. It's just in the mind. And then he, he gives you the, the coupe de grace, 
the mind doesn't really exist, angry people. Samsara and nirvana are just in the mind. And of course, in the in the Rinpoche Nyugu, which is uh, Tsongkhapa's explication of the hard parts of the uh, Pradipadyotana, which is the Chandrakirti's commentary on the Guya Samaja Tantra, Tsongkhapa says, uh, samsara and nirvana are not different. Not different. But this is even better. This is the root of samsara and nirvana is just in the mind. And then the mind doesn't really exist because nothing really exists with a capital R, really. They exist. That's okay. That means we can play with them. If they existed all by themselves, a capital E existence, and if you existed like that, like a capital L, Laura, oh, I'm Laura, I'm going to say myself, I'm David, then I can't deal with any. I mean, among other things, nobody would want to deal with me, but I just feel myself separate. This is, there's nothing to separate you, right? Not samsara, not nirvana. They're just in the mind, aren't they? Sure they are. And you know, what's amazing about that is if they're just in the mind, then guess what? You have the potential to decide where you want to go, right? Because we all have Buddha nature. You could say that, you know, in a doctrinaire kind of way. But we all know uh, psychologically how powerful our self-concept is. We can go wherever we want to go at any time. How do you like that? Oh, and this is another great one, 52. Attachment and hatred are like the traceless path of a bird. Imagine a bird flying in the sky. Attachment and hatred. You know, we in the first part, we're trying to control them. Right? Trying to control them. Not, you know, we're not getting attached to our bodies. It's like an impure, disgusting leather bag, etc. Here, it's like the traceless path of a bird. Don't get absorbed in experience, Tengri people. You know, in practice, in practice, you know, uh, because we're so competitive and so achievement oriented, uh, of course, that that goes with us. We take that with us into practice. And, uh, oh, I had this experience. Oh, the sky opened up. Oh, I saw Buddha. You know, whatever it is. And Padampa says, don't get absorbed in experience. It's great. The birthless dharmakaya, right, which is the undifferentiated body of reality, the source of all Buddhas, empty, is like the essence of the sun. The dharmakaya is like the sun in its bright light. There is no shadow. In other words, no differentiation. You have the simultaneous awareness of conventional and ultimate reality. There's no shadow, right? Form and emptiness, right? Wisdom and compassion. It's all there. It's all in the sunlight. I love this one, this next one, while we're still dwelling with the mind. A thought arising that seems to be an enemy. How many have had such a thought today? Hey, absolutely. It's like a thief in an empty house. This dude knew about thieves. Right? It's not just something that happens in New York City or Los Angeles. There's no gain or loss because there ain't nothing there. A thought arising. You had a thought. Wow. Um, uh, how do you like that? Um, it's like an empty house. You know, a, a psychiatrist once said to me, 
course you can hate someone you love. How do you like that? It's like an empty house, right? All okay. Which, by the way, if I would think of one thing that uh, that Jamsbal would always say that to me summed up everything, it was this. No matter what would happen, he would say, it is okay. It is okay. Kind of summed everything up. Um, and then he goes on in 55. Oh, feelings are like, are traceless like drawings on water. There is no holding on to erroneous appearances. We have feelings. We have feelings. Fine. Have feelings. And we go back to this this analogy of water, like drawings on water, or like Thich Nhat Hanh would say, waves on water. Same, right? And fixating on the instincts is like chasing a rainbow in the sky. Fixing on, that'd be, that'd be like therapy, like psychotherapy, right? <laughs> um, fixing on the instincts. Um, desire and attachment cannot be recognized, angry people. You can't, they, they don't even exist, right? The flitting of the mind is transparent like the sun in a cloudless sky. Don't trust the mind. In other words, don't give your mind to your mind. You know, in so many ways, he's contradicting himself. But that's just our conceptual view of things. He's saying the same thing over and over again, your natural mind, your natural mind. And then he's telling us how. Um, ungrasping self-liberation is like a cold wind. Don't make the grasping of desire your goal. Let's feel the cold wind right now. Imagine you're standing out there in an icy landscape. The cold wind is blowing. And what does that do to your sense of of desire. You know, one of my favorite parts of the uh, of the meditation on the four mindfulnesses is uh, um, the, which we get from the Satipatthana Sutta uh, is where we go to the mindfulness of mental objects and and it's really quite wonderful. You think about mental objects and you as you're breathing in and you're breathing out, and you think about how they're, they are impermanent, just like Padampa says in the first part of this, like visitors to the marketplace. That's what your, you and your family and your friends are. When your business is done, you leave. And as you focus deeply on how things come and go, you feel that you are craving desire to grab them, to hold them, chase after them, starts to dissipate somewhat. I'm not saying it disappears, but as we breathe in and breathe out and focus on their impermanence, we realize in a deep way and we start to let go. And that letting go is nothing other than a little taste of nirvana. That's what it is. No reason why we can't have a little taste of nirvana in this very life, right now, just breathing. Awareness, I'm on 59, is unreal like a rainbow in the sky. And look at this, awareness is rigpa. It's rigpa, awareness is unreal. Rigpa, taken as knowledge by many Buddhists, as real knowledge, is unreal like a rainbow in the sky. There is no impediment to experience. All right, at a certain point, you let everything go. 
not to say that all of what's come before isn't central to our evolution, right? All of our practices to become aware of our attachment and our aversion. We become more and more aware of them. We let them go. We play with them. We get a sense of wisdom, but even that, it's unreal, like a rainbow in the sky. Just let it go. Seeing the meaning of reality is like a dream of a mute person, free from words and convention. What a relief, especially for a scholar. No more words, no more conventions. How much time do we spend chasing down conventions when we're not even aware of them? So many things we do. So many things we do. You know, why do men do what they do? Why do women do what they do? Why? Convention. Convention. But the meaning of reality is free from that. And here we go to the arising of the experience of realization. We all wonder about that, right? What is enlightenment? What is, you know, what is it? Buddha was enlightened. You know, Tsongkhapa said when upon his enlightenment that it was the opposite of what he thought it would be. Now, you know, think about that. Tsongkhapa, most brilliant scholar, most realized master, and realization was the opposite of what he thought it would be. And here it says, the arising of the experience of realization is like the happiness of a child. Its rapture and ease cannot be expressed, angry people. How wonderful is that? All there for us. We, each one of us has the ability and awareness to experience that. We're just patient. And you know what? It doesn't even matter if I'm the one who experiences it. If you experience it, that's utterly ecstatic for me too. The indivisibility of clarity and emptiness is like the reflection of a moon in water. There is no attachment or obstruction of any kind. And of course, this we go into the, the similes that are used all the time by Buddha, that reality is like a magic show, an illusion, like a mirage, like space, like an echo, like a fairy city. Um, you know, when the sun rises higher, the fairy city that you saw in the clouds, it disappears because it was just an illusion. Um, yeah. Appearance, and we're on 63. Are we okay? Yes. Janet. Thank you. Are you saying fairy city like C-I-T-Y or yeah. S-I-D-D-E-Y? Yeah, oh, no, okay. no, fairy city, C-I-T-Y, right. It's a, it's a uh, you know, Gandharva city. Okay, you know, city, thank you. These, these fairies, right. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories is uh, is the Soundarananda, which was written by Ashvagosha, wonderful Buddhist writer in the first century, and uh, uh, it's about it's about Buddha's younger brother, whose name was Nanda. Now, do you think it could be easy? It would have been easy to be Buddha's younger brother. I mean, first of all, younger brother is tough. To begin with, almost as bad. By Louise, almost as bad as uh, you know a middle child. Okay, but younger brother ain't good. So what happens is, um, you know, Nanda is uh, is 
is married to Soundara. She's a wonderful woman. And uh and they're so deeply in love. And and Ashvagosha describes in wonderful detail, you know, their feelings for each other and their lovemaking. And uh but 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 Nanda, everyone keeps talking about his older brother Buddha. And so he decides that um he go. He, he wants to. He he wants to be. He, he doesn't know what to do when he goes to Buddha, and Buddha says to him, "You know, um, if you become a monk and follow the Dharma, uh, then uh, you will be able to go and be with the Apsaras, who are beautiful female goddesses." And uh, Buddha says to his younger brother. And they make your soundera look like a dog. Really says that. So Nanda then, he leaves the palace and he goes out and becomes the monk. And he practices so diligently and so, you know, and so hard. And uh, and the word gets around among the other disciples that this is why he's doing it. Because he thinks he can be with these apsaras. And eventually, one of them goes up to Nanda and says, "I heard this thing. You think you think that you're going to be with the Apsaras?" And and Nanda realizes at that point that you know Buddha told him a story, and uh, so he goes to Buddha and he says, "You weren't telling me the truth about the Apsaras." And at that point, he gets it, and he becomes a monk. And Soundara becomes a, a nun, and they're all happy. They all live happily ever after. Anyway, so that's, um, I don't know why I got off on that one. Um, but that, that's the, let's see. But now we go to uh, 63. Appearance and emptiness are indivisible like an empty sky in the mind. There is no middle and no end. Dingry people. Yeah, whenever when we were doing this, um, you know, the um one one of the big things, as I mentioned before, that Jamspal is preserving is the ancient way of of pronouncing the Tibetan. So these days, you know, modern Tibetans for for Dingri people would say would say Dingri Wa instead of Dingri Pa. And uh I remember my son, who was about five at the time, he used to hear us saying Dingriwa, and he used to repeat that all the time. But he says, mindfulness without distraction is like a dancer in the, mi in the mirror. In mindfulness, there is no belief system. Just beautiful. And I love 66, which is ungrasping bliss and emptiness is like sunlight reflecting on ice. There is nothing to hold on to. It's kind of cold, right? Um, but it it takes us away from the the passions and the the fear and the cravings that we have. So we got about ten minutes left. We've gotten we got to the 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 mind, um, the study of our natural mind, or really not the study of our mind, but that is being with our natural mind. And then he goes back at the end and he talks about, I'm up to 72 now. So, oh, wait, 71 is great too. Samsaric ignorance and confusion is like water coming up in a boggy marsh. Blocking it won't stop it. Okay, that's it. It's okay. Samsaric ignorance and confusion. Yeah, here it is right here. But you know what? It comes up like water coming up in a boggy marsh. As Jamspal said, it is okay. It is okay. It is okay to hate, to love, to chase after. It's all okay. 
And then samsara and nirvana are like illusion, free from the grasp of words. And he adds now, coming back to it, your helper is your special lama. Beautiful. And then in the end, in the last part of this, he goes back, he talks about the system of Mahayana as like a wish-fulfilling jewel, difficult to find. We know this. Um, then in 76, this life's food, clothing, and whatever you are doing is sufficient. Oh my, who, who doesn't grow older and say, well, you know, maybe I could have done more. Ah, it's okay. It is sufficient. It is sufficient. Concentrate on the Dharma as your goal. And then speaking of old age, 77, when you're young, you can engage in difficult practices. When you're old, you cannot control your body, Dingri people. Amen. Happens. Oh, and this 78, isn't this stuff wonderful? Padampa, thank you. Tuja, Che. When defilements arise, you train in the antidotes. Yes, we do. But you will be liberated with the symptoms staying in their own place. Dingry people, it's all right. It's all right. And of course, you know, this is very tantric. Um, you know, and, and, you know, some of us are studying, you know, Yamantaka, among other things, and where we use that energy, where all of those things that we tend to regard as bad, you know, attachment, hatred, all those emotions, but they're all just pure energy. And we can transform that energy. It can make us ecstatic. It can energize us. And then we can use that energy to help others. And that's Buddha's teaching is like the sun between clouds. It appears only now. And then he goes back to really to the path, to the stages of the path where he says, right, you blame others for both pleasure and pain, but the root condition is yourself. Yes. Um, and then when you associate with bad companions, bad conduct forcefully infects you. Give up sinful compa companions. See, now he's back with the natural mind thing. He would have said, concentrate on your own mind. Sinful companions, whatever. Um, but there are different times for different stages for all of us. Um, when you associate with good companions, wow, what a good evening this has been. Virtues forcefully arise in you. Associate with virtuous friends, Dingri people. Thank you for inviting me. And then he goes on and on until we get to the end where he says, I, the, in on 99, I, the Indian teacher, am not staying in Dingri. I am leaving. Cut off your misconceptions right now. Right now. Not tomorrow. We can do it right now. Right now. Natural mind. Goal. I practice without distraction. You will also follow in my footsteps, Dingri people. Very beautiful. And then we end on 74 with, uh, with this wonderful little couplet which is found in many places in the literature. I know it's found in Nagarjuna's eulogy in the perfection of wisdom literature. Ultimate wisdom is beyond words and thought. It's sky-like nature, unborn and unceasing, lies within each one's self-nature of wisdom. How do you like that? Lies within each one's self-nature of wisdom. Every one of you, it's all there. Okay, that's it.
We sort of got through the whole thing. <laughs> any any questions, comments? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Janet. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, what what is self nature? Because I'm I'm getting confused with thinking like how we're supposed to think there is no self. So what is self nature? Well, the self, small s self that we all have in our in our little selves, not like the capital S self that separates you. And knowing you, Janet, you would just go with a small j, Janet. And that's your and that's yourself. So it could be self arising. It arises right in you and can spread to everybody else because there's no separation between you and everybody else and everything else. Okay. So it's self-arising in the conventional sense. It comes from conventional you, which you're under no illusion is ultimate you. Okay. That there's a super Janet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Although there is, yeah. Okay. Anything? It's all beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> it's all so beautiful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. Hope to see you soon. Every one of you. Thank you. Okay. David. Thank this you so much, great. David. Favorite. Thank you so much, too. This is great. Good night. I had no idea what was going to happen. <laughs> Good, night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.